In this video, we're going to look at the steps required to build a simple parser in Rust. This is our sample input we'll be using. So we're imagining that this is the log from a key value database. So if the database were to crash, or if anyone were to want to do something else with the data, they'll be able to play this back and reconstruct the state of the database. So not too important, but that's our sample input. That's the context we're working within. And our format is just a key equal to a value. And then we've got special control characters, which are a colon followed by some name of a control sequence and whatever their input will be. So in this case, we've got a delete key with the key to delete from the database. So we need to transform the way we look at this into a state machine. That's step one, so that we can write a program that will follow that state machine and parse the text as it goes. So let's have a look at the state machine. So we start at the start of a line and then we follow arrows as we move through the text. So if our first character is a colon, then we'd go to pass a control sequence. If not, then we go down and we look for a key. So that will mean looking for letters, A through Z, until we find something else. If instead we find an equals, then we move over to parsing a value. Again, we look for letters, A through Z. And when we reach the end of the line, then we found both our key and our value and we start a new line. So then say we find a colon at the start of the line, then we parse a control sequence. So that would be a name for a control operation. Again, named with just letters A through Z until we find a space. And then at that point, we would parse the input for that. So in this case, we're only implementing a delete control. So we just expect to find a key exactly following it. But if we had other control sequences that took different commands, maybe to delete a certain number of things or to compact a certain number of previous keys, something like that, we might parse something different here and the state machine would grow. But for us, we're just going to parse a key. And then at the end of the line, we come back and the whole process starts again. So when we start to think about it like this, it becomes much clearer how we might write code to follow this. So let's jump in and start having a look at the code for it. So here's the code for our parser. The first thing we do is load up the key value store log. So let's have a quick look at that again. So it's got keys and values, and then lines that start with a colon are a control. So this is a delete control, which deletes the key fruit. So with that in mind, the first thing we do after we've loaded up our file is to wrap it in a buffered reader. So we do this so we can access the lines function. Now we could handle new lines as part of our parser, but Rust provides us this way to iterate through lines, which is really convenient because it means that we know when we've reached the end of a line, we can just jump back to the top of our parser. We don't have to worry about those state transitions ourselves. So convenience thing, very useful and simplifies our work a little bit. So then having a look at what our parser does, it accepts those lines as an input and it immediately builds a state to work with. So the state contains the lines to work with, but it also contains the output. So this key value store structure that we're trying to rebuild. And that's just a hash map of string to string. So from keys to values. And this is always going to be the case. If you're building a parser, you're going to want to send the data you're discovering somewhere. So as you interpret it and turn it into something meaningful, that might be a state that you rebuild like a data structure, or you might stream it somewhere or take some actions based on what you're seeing. But there'll always be some equivalent of this, something you're doing with this data you're reading in. Then once we've built our structure, we start iterating through our lines. So while we get lines back, we take each line and we create a characters iterator over it. So to look at what that would do, we'd be giving back our first line initially. And then when we call characters on that line, we'd be getting back the F, the R, the U, the I, the T, one at a time as we call next on that iterator. And then we make our iterator peekable. So this is a way of saying, I need to be able to look ahead in my iterator by one element. I can look at what's coming next without consuming an element from my iterator. So we'll see how that's useful as we start the next step. Just before we jump into that though, it's worth having a look at what the functions that are remaining are. So we've got parse line, control, parse delete key, parse the key in a key value pair, parse the value in a key value pair. So these look pretty much exactly like the state diagram we just saw, and that's deliberate and expected. So that's one of the reasons that this is so useful to convert a text format into a state diagram before you start. 
because it lets you write functions that match those states, and the transitions between the states are calls and returns between functions. So it makes it very easy to translate something visual, an understanding of the input format, into code. So then let's have a look at what the peak line function does. So it's going to have a look at, oh sorry, parse line function. So it's going to peak the first character out of the line. If it's a colon, we parse a control sequence. Anything else, we try and parse a key. So this is where it's really useful to be able to peak. If we consumed the first character of our line, and then we had to parse a key, we'd have to reconstruct that first character of the key back onto the front of the key, and it all gets a bit fiddly. And especially as this becomes more complicated, if you have more states to go through, passing things around gets complicated. So being able to look ahead means we don't have to do that. We can just look, decide, and then parse. So in the case that we're parsing a control, we consume one character to get rid of that colon from our iterator, and then we try and parse a control. So the way that the parse control works, it will create an infinite loop to run through all the characters in the line until it reaches a space. When it finds a space, it'll consume it and then stop, stop running because at that point we've consumed enough characters to build our control, which is what we were trying to do. If we reach the end of the line before that happens, we'll also stop. We probably ought to error here, but for now we're just going to stop because we know that we're going to trust our input format. And then any other characters get pushed into the control. So we're building a string based on the characters that we've seen until we reach our space. So then we have a look at our control. If it's delete, then we parse the known content that follows the delete, which is a key. Otherwise, we're going to error, saying that we don't know what this control sequence is. So allowing for new ones to be added in the future, just will error until we know how to support parsing them. So then parsing delete key is very similar. So we know that keys are the letters A through Z. So we're going to do a separate, very similar thing. We're going to loop. We're going to read each character. If it's allowed to be part of the key, we push it into the key string. Otherwise, if it's some other character that we don't support in the name of a key, we just error with an unexpected character. If we reach the end of the line, we break. And then this is where we then start to manipulate state. So we know that we've parsed a delete, otherwise we wouldn't have called this function. And then we've parsed a key. So we're going to remove that key from the key value store. So if you're going to make this really nice and careful about what it's doing, you could check that that key really exists at this point because we shouldn't have recorded a delete for a key that didn't exist in our database log. But for now, again, we're going to trust our input format. So at this point, we've reached the end of a key for a control sequence. We should have reached the end of the line. So at that point, we can stop and we come all the way back up. So we return OK here. That would come out of this match block here. Again, return OK. And then we're right back up to where we would have called parse control. That would finish the match block. Again, we'd return. And that would take us all the way back up to our while loop. And we can consume another line. So then following it down again, parse a line. This time, let's assume we're not going to go down the control path. We'll go down the key path. And there's not too much new here. So we're going to look for letters A through Z. Push them to a key if we find them. If we find an equals then we consume the equals, we break, that's the end of that loop, and then we parse a value for that key value pair. And again, this is similar, we look for letters, we push them into the value, if we see unexpected characters, we error, we break when we reach the end of the line, and then we push that key value pair that we've constructed into our key value store. And then coming right back up to the top, when we're done with our parsing, that will output that key value store, or that state, and we just print that out. So let's see that running. Okay, let's kick this off. And it prints out the key value store that it's tried to build. So let's paste in quickly the input that we had. So we can see we get fruit apple, which gets deleted later. So there should be no fruit key, correct? Vegetable, we set to carrot but that's then overwritten by vegetable potato, which shows up in our output. Sound is written once as beep. Spice is written once as cinnamon. And color written once as blue. And because it's being pushed into a hash set, 
we wouldn't expect it to have maintained order. So spice and color out of order, but that's to be expected, that's fine. We weren't trying to maintain that. Good, so it looks like that's working. Let's jump back to the code quickly. You can see we can build a parser like this, and we could actually parse reasonably complicated file formats like this. Trying to parse a full programming language like Rust like this would be quite challenging. You'd want some more theory, some more tools to be able to go about it. But in principle, it's not that different the way the Rust parser will work, or any parser will work. It has to look at text, it has to look a certain distance ahead, and it has to do something with that as it builds it. So the idea kind of holds. And although it's really good to know how to do this, there are tools pre-built for Rust that we can use. So in another video, I'm going to have a look at parsing this same input using the nom crate, which lets us build parsers like this in a more declarative way. So we can tell it what the format of our content is. It'll figure out how to parse it for us, which is a really good way to build a parser if you're trying to do it faster or part of a project or for a more complicated format that you're going to have to maintain over time. Thanks for watching.